Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Lucy Hillier. I'm the coordinator for the Community Child Protection Exchange and I'd like to welcome you to today's joint webinar. This one's called uh, the Community-Based Child Protection Mechanisms in Protracted Refugee Settings in Uganda and Rwanda, Findings and Recommendations. This webinar has been hosted by the Child Protection in Crisis Learning Network, which is also known, and I'll refer to as, the CPC Network, and the Community Child Protection Exchange. Um, the webinar will last about an hour, possibly an hour and 15 if we get our respondent online. We're having a few technical difficulties. Um, we'll pause during the presentation and take some questions, um, any clarifications as well, and invite our respondent to provide us with some of his thoughts. Um, now, a little bit of uh, just uh, technical logistics. If you want to ask questions, you need to use the chat box on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. I hope you've all found it. I saw that a lot of you were also doing the audio setup. Um, you should know that we've actually disabled your audio for speaking, but you can, of course, hear us. Um, and we'll do our best to read all the questions that you type in the, type in the chat box and answer as many as possible. Um, if you need to speak to the person collecting the questions, this is Sarah Lilly, and she is currently online. Um, so, you know, if Whilst we're using this to ask questions, feel free to use the chat box um, for chatting to each other as well, which we encourage. So feel free to discuss the issues between yourselves as well as with us. Um, also to let you know that this webinar is being recorded, we will post the recording as soon as we possibly can after the session on our two network sites, one being the CPC network, the other being the exchange site. I've got the URL, um, we'll just post it at the end of the session so that you can see where you can find the recording. Um, so moving on, um, I'd like to do some introductions. So this webinar will be presented by Mark Canavera. And a little bit about Mark. Mark is the Associate Director of the Child Protection and Crisis Learning Network, which brings together academics, NGO and other practitioners, as well as policy makers, to build the evidence base for international child protection and family welfare. He's a skilled child protection specialist with over a decade of experience with program management, research and training. Mark's field experience has been concentrated mainly in French-speaking West Africa. He's worked with organizations including Save the Children, Child Frontiers, UNICEF and Oxfam Great Britain. His most recent work included supporting the governments of Benin, Niger, Côte d'Ivoire, and Cameroon to map and assess their national child protection system. He's evaluated protection programs in the Greater Mekong subregion of Southeast Asia and the DRC and Northern Uganda, as well as some uh, work in child protection and emergencies in Nigeria, and even small arms control in Senegal and the promotion of girls' education in Burkina Faso. The second person I would like to introduce to you, and I'm hoping that he's getting online as I speak, um, is our respondent. Um, today our respondent will be Alfred Mutiti. Um, Alfred uh, has worked, currently he's working in Juba in South Sudan with UNICEF. Um, he is a child protection and psychosocial support specialist. He has worked in Sri Lanka with UNICEF and Liberia, also as child protection specialist. And prior to this, he was in Uganda with UNICEF as a program officer with a focus on northern Uganda. Um, Alfred has co-authored one of the most groundbreaking studies in northern Uganda, the Northern Uganda Psychosocial Needs Assessment. Um, and his primary focus areas of work include strengthening child protection systems in conflict and post-conflict settings. Um, Alfred's got a master's degree in Public Administration and Management and a Bachelor of Social Sciences from the Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda. He's also a PhD student with the University of South Africa and is currently working uh, with community structures for sustainable social reintegration. So, going on from that, I will hand you over to Mark, who's going to present um, the research. Um, from Rwanda and Uganda. We will have a bit of a pause uh, where you'll be able, to, you can send in questions at any time and we'll answer some of those questions before we resume. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. Over to you. 
Um, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, um, taking time out of your busy schedules to uh, hear about what we're learning as we um, finalize some research that we undertook in uh, refugee settings in Uganda and Rwanda. Um, I know that this is a busy time for everybody. Just so that I can make sure that you're hearing me, could you underneath your name click on the little um, smiley face and make some form of uh, sign, be it a smiley face or an LOL or a thumbs up or a thumbs down. All right, so we have lots of, uh, some people hearing me anyway. Um, the, um, I'm going to try to move up relatively quickly through the how of how we undertook this, this research, um, because it is a method that um, has been used in many settings before, and I'll go a bit through the history of how this methodology was developed. But um, the first thing I want to point out is that this uh, research was undertaken as part of a large consortium of, of agencies. Um, the agency that coordinated the process was a Health Net TPO, uh, and the co-administrator was TPO Uganda. Um, and this is a psychosocial focused uh, set of organizations that have a long history working on child protection, and also a long history working with displaced populations. Um, we did undertake this research in very close collaboration with uh, UNHCR uh, as they attempt to uh, develop new strategies to implement their new protection framework. They have a new framework for the protection of children. Um, and so everything from site selection through the development of the guidance that will emerge from this process has been done hand in hand with UNHCR. Um, a big shout out to InterAid. InterAid is on the webinar with us, and I'm very uh, excited for that. InterAid is uh, an organization based in Kampala, Uganda, that focuses specifically on working with urban refugees. And as we reach the Uganda component of the research, you'll see that um, InterAid was, was crucial. They, they hosted the, the research in the urban settings in Uganda. AFSI Rwanda is also represented here. If you see somebody named Lorette in the participants list, she is the country director for AFSI Rwanda. AFSI Rwanda is um, the NGO that undertakes most of the child protection activities in the refugee settings in Rwanda where we undertook the study, and they also were the, the lifeline of this research in, in that country. Um, there was some technical support provided by professors at Columbia University who oversaw the process. Um, and in the end, the funding for this came from uh, the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration at the U.S. State Department, as well as the USAID Space Children and Orphans Fund. As you can imagine, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight organizations all linked uh, through the CPC Learning Network. Um, a very collaborative piece of research, and of course that means that things often take more time, but I think we all agree that the, the collaboration of all of these agencies made things all the more richer. Um, the primary research questions that we were asking uh, through this process the, the first was the following, which community-based child protection mechanisms exist in protracted refugee settings? And again, the two countries selected were Uganda and Rwanda. Uh, and we really wanted to explore how these community-based child protection mechanisms, and we'll go through the definition that we were using in just a bit. Um, how do they link? or act in parallel with the other more formal components of the National Child Protection uh, and education systems. Um, I use the word national here, but I would add that uh, there are often already separate or parallel child protection and education service delivery systems set up in refugee settings. And uh, in each country, where Uganda and Rwanda, the, the setup was different. Uh, one was urban, one was a camp setting. 
and we'll see what was established on behalf of the refugee populations there and then how the community-based child protection mechanisms interacted with those or not. The ultimate goal was to ask how can UNHCR and as partner organizations, especially international and national NGOs, engage with community child protection mechanisms for more effective and sustainable results. So uh, an action-oriented research uh, aimed at the policy and the practice of those who are assisting refugees. Uh, when I mention community-based child protection mechanisms or community child protection mechanisms, uh, this is quite a broad group that we're talking about here. Uh, in the first instance, this represents, you know, groups or networks that respond to and prevent issues of child protection at the grassroots level. Uh, so this can be things like um, child protection committees, vigilance groups, um, camp committees, a number of networks and groups, uh, church groups, uh, women's associations, that come together with the goal of, of promoting the well-being and the protection of children in their settings, in their communities. Um, again, these range from family and peer support groups, and we'll see in one instance that kind of clan-based groups uh, became very important for children, to women's groups, religious groups, youth groups, and many others. They also, um, when we say mechanism, it's not just groups and things that kind of exist as uh, coalitions of actors, but processes, community-based processes, traditional processes, and more formal mechanisms initiated by government and national, act, national and international actors um, to officially provide recourse when cases of child protection arise or to seek to prevent child protection issues arising. Um, so there is, of course, some blurriness between the community level uh, processes and mechanisms and uh, the more quote-unquote formal mechanisms that we hear about. Um, some examples are child welfare, child protection committees, which we will see in each of the settings, religious groups that support orphans and vulnerable children. Um, we've mentioned family responses to problems such as teenage pregnancy here. I actually think um, that might be below the level of our, our definition, and maybe I wouldn't include this if I had to redo the research framework, but, um, uh, but traditional processes where community members have set processes and mechanisms by which they respond to incidents that arise, uh, those would definitely be a community child protection mechanism. Um, I will spend some time talking a bit about the methodology and how this arose. Um, the nature of this methodology was purely qualitative, and in nature it was ethnographic. Um, this is a process that has been used in a number of places that was developed through an iterative process that many of those of uh, you who are involved with the Community Child Protection Exchange know well as well as those who are involved with the CPC Learning Network. Um, there is an interagency learning initiative on community-based child protection mechanisms and child protection systems that has, to date, undertaken similar studies that were ethnographic in nature in Sierra Leone and Kenya. Uh, the tools for those also grew out of work that was done by the agency Child Frontiers, where I used to be employed, uh, looking at the same question, what are the informal elements of a community, uh, child, of a child protection system? What are the processes and mechanisms that happen at community level? Uh, and how do they link with what more formal services are on offer from government and NGO service providers? So through a number of conversations, colloquia, um, the tools have evolved over time. Uh, the, and ethnography, as most of you know, typically takes, you know, a year or many years to undertake. But the idea is that you can use the same lens 
which is to look at things from the ground up, from the perspective of people who are simply living their lives and do that in a rapid phase to understand uh, how they see the world and what uh, and uh, what surrounds them. So we, um, for this research process in Uganda and Rwanda, we sent teams of six to seven researchers to each site, and I'll get to the sites in just a minute, for about four weeks of data collection. So it is a, a short data collection process, but it is ethnographic in nature in that uh, the aim is to scientifically describe a specific society or culture. I mean, what we're looking at here is not to describe what is, uh, such a qualitative ethnographic method cannot get at quote unquote fact, um, but to understand the worldview and the beliefs and, the, of, and the, the practices, the ways of living of participants and research interlocutors through their own eyes um, without the imposition of outsider categories. So we don't, in undertaking this, we don't use words like child protection. Tell us how you protect children. You start with much more basic questions, um, like what is childhood? Tell us about the lives of children in your community. And then you allow the participants to guide the conversation where it will go. Always bearing in mind that what we are looking at here is what the international community would call child protection but that uh, the words and the ways of viewing and thinking about this are likely to be very different uh, from the perspective of people living in these refugee settings. So in terms of tools, which I did skip, it is primarily in-depth interviews, also group discussions, uh, key informant interviews, as well as body mapping for some engagement with them. Um, children who are younger than, than adolescent years. Uh, the research sites themselves were protracted refugee settings, and this was at the request of UNHCR and uh, the U.S. Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration. There were two sites each in each country. In Uganda, these were urban sites, and in Rwanda, they were urban. Something that's very important to note here is that uh, according to Uganda's law on refugees, uh, although there are camps set up in Uganda for arriving refugees, they are allowed to leave those camps by law, but they then waive their right to access to certain services. Um, so it's a bit of a conundrum for those working with these refugees who have, quote unquote, waived their rights, although rights are not uh, necessarily waivable by international standards, but this is the, this is the scenario in Uganda. Uh, there were actually three communities that we worked with in Uganda, and I would really encourage InterAid to um, be typing any additions corrections or uh, other pieces of information in the chat box as I make this presentation uh, and so that I don't misrepresent the findings here. And they work very closely with these populations. But um, two Congolese refugee communities, Nsambia Keombe and Makimbia Lubuna, and one Somali community, Kasato and Kisang. Uh In Rwanda, quite different. So these are uh, just to finalize on the urban sites in Uganda. These were refugees living in urban settings in Kampala, the capital, uh, mixed in with the general Ugandan population. A very different setting then from Rwanda, which was camp setting. Rwanda has um, four refugee camps and one transit center, and we selected two of those each of which has around 15,000 people living in the camp. These are camps that have been there since the mid-1990s in the aftermath of the Rwandan genocide. They are largely um, Kenya Rwanda phones. That is, they speak the same language as the population of Rwanda, 
However, they are of Congolese nationality and are refugees. In those camps, Gehembe and Tuziba, uh, we picked two quartiers, so the camps are subdivided into um, are subdivided into quartiers or neighborhoods, and we pick two per camp in which to undertake the in-depth quality of research. Uh, in addition to Lorette from AFSI Rwanda, we also have Imogen Frickett on the participants list here, and she was the lead researcher in Rwanda, so I think we have a lot of good backup for any um, errors that I might make, and I encourage uh, Imogen and Lorette to also please type things into the chat box where I might be slightly misspeaking. I'll start first with Uganda, and then we'll take a short break uh, for questions, comments, and concerns. Um, the key finding in Uganda around sources of harm was crystal clear, and I think this gives us real pause about the way that we think about the child protection sector in protracted refugee settings. The most effective way to protect refugee children was to send them to school. It sounds obvious enough, but <laughs> this was um, a very clear message sent by the refugee communities that we spoke to that um, barriers to access to school, which we will get into in a minute, are, are really the primary force that are creating uh, protection issues for their children. Another very important thing to note here is that this doesn't end with primary school. Uganda does have a universal primary education, but again, we'll get to some of the barriers to that in just a few minutes. Um, but it's uh, really when you reach the level of secondary school that children uh, start dropping out in much larger numbers from school. Uh, or never entering it at all for those who arrive as refugees. And this um, really the focus of much of what the participants in Uganda and you will see in Rwanda told us was that adolescence was a time period in children's lives when um, when when really school would, would be a significant protective factor and um, and is not always available. More than 90% of the group discussions that we undertook in Uganda listed the lack of access to education as one of the top three harms to children that occurred. Um, and then there's a little bit of a difference between the Somali and the Congolese uh, refugee communities and what they listed as other key sources of harm. Uh, for both, the other top two harms, the, the top two harms were lack of education, and then the second was discrimination, which we will hear quite about a bit about in just a minute. Um, and then in, for the Somali community, the third most important harm was drug abuse, and the fourth was child trafficking. Now, when I presented these findings to UNHCR, they noted that no instances of child trafficking had been confirmed in Uganda among the refugee population. But I think the question here is about perceptions, and this was about children's, uh, first of all, this was listed by community members themselves, so even if there aren't confirmed cases, they certainly perceive this to be an issue. And when we talk about child trafficking, this is instances of, of um, young and older adolescents very willing to enter into extreme exploitive situations including uh, international labor trafficking and international labor migration that becomes exploitive um, because they don't have any opportunities in their own communities. In terms of who's helping the children in these urban refugee settings, um, in both of the communities studied in Uganda, that is the Congolese and Somali communities, really parents emerged very strongly as the primary helpers. This is no surprise. Parents are the primary helpers of their children the world over. 
But I think as we'll see as these findings progress, the real question becomes is how can agencies intervene in a way that strengthens parents' ability to care for their children? Um, as we'll see moving forward, parents feel very disempowered, primarily because of their economic situation, but also because of discrimination from their host community to properly raise their children and provide for them in the way that they would like to. Um, schools, which, uh, you know, this research had a special focus on uh, education and the role of the education system, um, are not, were not perceived as entry points for reporting issues and threats that were happening to children. They were only involved in support processes to children and families. Um, when the risk actually was happening at the school setting. Um, the processes and mechanisms used by families to support children were both community-based and formal, but I would say that the, on balance, the community-based informal mechanisms and structures were where people were turning to in the overwhelming majority of cases. Within the Somali refugee community, the community leadership, uh, and that includes religious leaders and clan-based structures, um, were the main avenues of recourse. In the Congolese community, um, church associations were what we heard the most about. In terms of who is doing what when protection issues arise, um, to return to that number one harm that we started with, which was um, children dropping out of school, you know, parents and communities made every effort to find ways of enabling children to return to school through church collections, negotiations with teachers, parents taking on extra work, parents having their children work. There were a variety of strategies that parents were using uh, in collaboration with their community members of their typically of their, their same background of origin. Um, that being said, all of these collective efforts um, didn't necessarily have the intended impact. And most acknowledge that the majority of refugee children, especially adolescents, were out of school. Um, there are the endogenous mechanisms that I've mentioned prior, you know, the clan-based structures in the Somali community, the religious leaders in both communities. Um, in addition, we would have the Congolese refugees also just describe networks of friends and neighbors. So not something that's a formal structure, but the, the friends and neighbors that they know that they can turn to. Um, interestingly, there are new child protection and education committees established, uh, not Necess not for the refugees themselves, but in many of the communities where the refugees live. Um, the main responsibilities are to promote school enrollment, to encourage parents to send their children to school, raise awareness of child protection issues in the community, and they did have an identification role of children who are in need of support. Um, there was some thinking from the Actors in the NGO and UN communities that these committees held great promise for serving as a linkage between children and communities and the services on offer. Um, but that remains to be seen if that's what will happen in reality. Um, I think I've mentioned a few times that access to school is a problem in many instances. And access to services in general um, is, is perceived to be difficult by the refugees. Um, refugee children were perceived not to have equal access to child protection mechanisms such as including schools, but also including, for example, uh, local government officials, health services, social services, um, because of discrimination, and we've already heard that discrimination is perceived as a source of harm. Um, and I will send, I'll share a few quotes in just a minute about where this, uh, how this discrimination is perceived. But turning to schools specifically, 
Um, Uganda's universal primary education system does apply to the refugee communities living in Uganda. Um, what, is, what serves as a barrier here is not a new story. It's the associated costs with attending school. School books, uniforms, pencil paper, things that should be very um, basic and straightforward uh, become very problematic when refugee families don't have high places. Um, these barriers apply not only to the refugee children in the communities that we were working in, but to Ugandan children from very poor families in general. Um, but it was noted that refugee children were statistically more numerous because their parents had far more difficulty finding work uh, for a number of reasons, discrimination, language barriers, and um, lack of, of networks within the, the informal economy in Kampala. I just pulled out two quotes here that I thought really illustrated uh, the way that the refugee communities felt about their access to services. The first is from a young man, uh, an adolescent male. In this community, the risk we face we as children face are many. Notably, first you can't play with others. They discriminate you that you are Congolese, you are not Uganda. When you go to school, they discriminate you saying that you are Congolese and you do not know the language and you are isolated. The third, when you go fetch water, you sometimes find Ugandan children older than us who pour your water down and tell us to refetch again. I really thought this quote captured that from the playground to the well to school, you know, children uh, felt a variety of forms of isolation and discrimination. An adult male who was in his 50s uh, was more blunt, he says. We know that we live with the citizens of this country and they do not like us. They have hatred, hatred towards our children. Um, I would add, you know, when I presented these findings to UNHCR, they did not necessarily agree that discrimination was strongly felt by the refugees, but I think that it is a theme that comes out very, very strongly in, in most of the interviews and group discussions that we held. Uh, we're almost nearing the end of the Uganda section. I am aware that I've been talking for a long time now. Um, looking at linkages between the clan-based, religious, neighbor-based, mechanisms and the formal services on offer. Um, for some aspects of the child protection system, the theoretical referral pathways were clear. For example, for rape, service providers knew that a local counselor, the government official, would refer to the police. The police would refer to interaid or to other organizations, such as the Office of the Prime Minister, which shares responsibility for the refugee population in Uganda with uh, UNHCR. However, it was notable that there was no real coordination mechanism that would really link all of these pieces together. And if uh, refugees feel that they don't have access even to that first step, the local counselor, it can be very difficult for them to enter the theoretical referral pathway. Uh, again, Many NGO workers noted that the Child Protection and Education Committee could serve as powerful connectors between the communities and the more formal services. Uh, but as they're still establishing themselves, we can't really say that they were performing the function. One thing that's notable in a study that's looking at child protection and education is that beyond the primary school children who were refugees who were in school, there really wasn't much of a connection between the refugees and the schools themselves. Refugee parents are almost never involved in parent-teacher associations, for example. 